Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome back to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for getting ahead as a student, becoming more productive, but a terrible resource for learning how to become the next evil Knievel and jump a Harley over like 500 semi-trucks through flaming hoops. Yeah, it is a terrible resource for that because I would strongly advise against trying that. I don't know about that, man. That's pretty rad. That's cool. How can um, you crush people's dreams just like that? Just I advised you against it. Don't do stuff that's super cool. Because I want them to live. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> fair. That's a good counterpoint. That's a good counterpoint. So uh, this is the last episode of the College Info Geek podcast. Yeah. But At wait. 300. 300. 300. But oh. it's not the last episode of us podcasting together. No, it's not. Because uh, we literally are the normal schedule, like the same amount of time you would expect 301 to come out. It's actually just going to be episode one of the Inforium instead. Yep. yep. It's not even going to be like pushed off by a month or so. It'll just show up. So, I you anticipate, know, get ready for that. I anticipate that uh, a lot of people just didn't see us making this announcement over the past several weeks and on Instagram and everything. So they're probably going to see this in their feed and it's going to say the end of the CIG podcast and they'll have to click it. And then now they'll know. Yeah. We're just changing the name, baby. That's yep. it. We're changing we the name, have, getting some new years, vibes. How many years has it been since I've been in college? Um, when, what year did you graduate? 2013. I graduated December now, of 14. It's now 2020 and it's past the date I would have graduated. So seven years I've been done. I've been building this company. It's been a good seven years. I don't even feel that old. I've had an all right seven years. Have been There have been ups, there have been downs. Some part, there, it's been a roller coaster of a seven mm-hmm. years. It's not, that's not unheard of. Pretty normal adult experience, I'd say. That's true. Some people like roller coasters. Not you, though. N- no. The last time I went on one, I went on one so that, like, just because I, I felt like Ashley wanted me to. And it's, I don't, like, scream or anything on roller coasters. But as soon as I got in it, I was like, oh, God, I'm trapped. Oh, God, I'm trapped. What have I done? I'm going to have a panic <laughs> attack. So I had to, like, do some deep, immediate meditation. And I, like, withdrew into myself. And I just sat in silence as I was thrown about through the sky. <laughs> I think what we've learned is when didn't you like choose to engage in thrill seeking activities, particularly ones that I didn't people, want. To, yeah. Bad things uh, happen. Bad things. I feel like I learned this lesson over and over. Usually I'll have an instinct and it'll say, Martin, don't do that. But then I'm like, but what if I'm supposed to? And then I do it. And then like everything, fa- I break my finger, everything falls apart and it's a bad idea. So I just really got to remember, <laughs> hey, you didn't want to do that. Don't do yeah, it. Don't do it. Just don't do it. If there's ever a time in the future where I go crazy and I'm like, Martin, you got to go downhill mountain biking with me again. I try to convince myself no. that I'm just being too cautious out of fear or something. But it's actually like, no, I, I don't think I would like it even if mm-hmm. I survived. Second of all, I'm not lucky when it comes to doing things that I didn't intend to do first. Maybe there's some sort of like mental block that keeps me from performing at my most coordinated or something. Because I'm like, I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do this. But I, you know what? I 100% agree with it. And I don't think it's just you. I think intention actually does tie into your like full unconscious commitment to doing a thing. So yeah. I was I was doing downhill mountain biking on Monday um, with my friend Charles, and my right or my rear brake pad started to go. Nice. And so when you when you when you hear the rear brake pad on a bike start to go, at least with disc brakes, you're going to hear it screaming like a banshee, but it is not yet down to bare metal and it's still gripping like a normal brake. And so he he that's what he told me. He's like the the pads aren't fully worn away, they're just getting close and test it. They are still closing fine. So you can finish these few runs and then you'll want to change it out, but you don't need to feel the need to walk the bike down or anything. So I continue to ride with him knowing cerebrally in the conscious part of my brain that the brake pads work. But the fact that they were screaming at me totally threw off my intention to 
ride downhill to the best of my ability. And I found myself making so many dumb mistakes. Mm. I almost flew off into the forest on a berm. Uh, even nice. like a, a really easy wood roller. I almost went off the side where I never would before. And it's because in the back of my head, I was like, my bike is not in full working order. I don't feel comfortable about this. And there's no convincing myself in a true unconscious way that this is fine, even though I know the brakes are closing. So I just decided, you know what? I'm going to roll the jumps. I'm going to just do it real light. I'm going to get to the bottom and that's going to be it. You know, that that actually makes a lot of sense. I bet that does happen with me. Like I wasn't, I didn't want to do this, so I can't mm -hmm. be coordinated for it because part of me is holding back and you need yep. your full self to do. Because whenever yeah. I want to do something, like that time we were like, let's climb really irresponsibly down the side of this mountain thing. That seems like, some, <laughs> like I don't have any problems at all. I'm just like, whoa, let's do it. But I wanted yep. to. You were in your, I bet if I didn't, it. I bet if I was like scared the whole time, I would have like slipped or something. Yeah. I got, I got to trust that my instinct knows when I want and should do something. Well, if there's one thing I've learned from a lifetime of doing extreme sports, it's that you really have to commit to things to do them correctly. And usually when you get hurt, it's because you kind of half-assed something. Yeah. Like every time I, I've never been like you tried, hurt. you tried to be a little safe about it. Like you held back cause yep. you were scared or you weren't fully committed and you were, you doing can't do 80% of attention. a backflip. You got to do 100% of the backflip mm -hmm. or nothing at all. Yeah. Every time I fully committed to a backflip, I do it fine. You know, maybe I'll land on like, I, I go down to my knees or something, but the only time I ever landed on my neck with, uh, with a backflip and it was on a trampoline when I was in high school, uh, I was scared and I was hesitant doing it. Didn't fully commit. And I didn't know the technique either. There's That's like an interesting life lesson. That feels so, like. Yeah. If you're going to do risky things, number one, do it with somebody who is good at it, who can kind of help you a little bit. It's good to have either a coach or someone to follow who is a little bit better than you. I really find this with downhill. Um, Charles is about 5% better than I am at downhill. And <laughs> without him leading into jumps, I will do fewer of them myself. But when I see like, oh, he just did a jump and he's fine. I'll do it because it's just it's just a little bit of confirmation. Yes, you can do this. Yeah. Having that and then having just the guts to fully commit and be fully locked in and concentrated on what you're doing is essential. And every hmm. time I've been minorly hurt, it's been me either being like, I don't really know if I want to do this. I guess I'll just try it. And then. You know, you're you're of two minds and you got to be of one mind. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Interesting. OK, well, anyway, this is episode 300 and it's not actually <laughs> an episode about how best not to hurt yourself while doing no, it's, extreme it's sports. Not. Although there's a nice little I didn't even I never thought about that. So that's a little bonus lesson for me as well. Yeah. So, Martin, you want to go do downhill? Um, <laughs> the correct answer so you, you is no. See, I don't want to do downhill. I think if I was ever to do a mountain bike thing again, what it would be is you would have to show me the the path first. Mm. I would have to see it. And I think that there are some paths, if they were simple enough, because I'm not a fast kind of person. I don't want to yeah. go fast. I want to go smoothly. So yeah. if it were like, this is just a nice smooth ride with a couple of curves down a really nice view. I might be like, yeah, that looks awesome. But if it's mm. got any jumps or it accelerates me too much, I'm going to be like acceleration isn't what's fun for me. I'm the kind of person who will meditatively walk heel to toe, super slow. Yeah. And like, that's what I want. But but smoothly biking would be really fun. Yeah. yeah and, and it seems I've like run through I've never seen a trail other than the one in Minneapolis or in Duluth, which was like, let's jump you off these rocks with blind <laughs> blind curves and by the way when there are a bunch of rocks in the dirt so when you fall you're going to smash your head against one of them yeah that was cool i've mentally run through like what could have gone differently on that day so many times i should have listened to my instinct i directly thought i actually yeah. even told ashley i don't think i want to this is going to make you feel bad my bad uh i don't want to do this but tom's unsure about minneapolis so i want to at least try to show oh that we can gosh. still do like cool <laughs> things here and then i break my finger and then we don't go to minneapolis so you know that was cool yeah i've also thought like life's hard what are i you thought gonna do? i thought that me leading would be good but i think it may have actually been better for you to lead so that you would I, be able I, to see if i was gonna something up 
no i wondered whoops i wondered if um whoops if you were going to we'll just have to beep it yeah the first beep in cig episode 300 we did it (laughs) episode 300 we did it that's a peek behind the curtain um okay so uh, i was thinking is if I led, it would be good for you. But I think if you were to lead, you probably would have just gone really slow and there wouldn't have been any unconscious need for you to keep up with me. And I was going slow, but I think that I was still going too fast. I was super uncomfortable with the jumps. Yeah. Off of even They weren't even really jumps. They were just like off of slight they were elevated rollers, rocks. I don't think and I'm you like, knew how to handle the rollers. I had never done it before. And yep. the problem was, even if I was physically capable, because I was unsure of it, I couldn't handle it confidently. Yep. And so they all became twice as dangerous by mm-hmm. default. Yeah. There's, there's probably some progression you could have done. Anyway. Yeah. You can't cry over spilled milk things happen and you can't go back and and make them not happen. But we do know that there is a parallel universe out there where you got on that bike and you were like doing 360 McFlippy twists off of every probably and And the other one where I died thing and the other one where you died and the other one where. But hey, I'm not that one, a sentient cockroach and he's he becomes your mentor. And then instead of ramping off of it, it kind of I kind of break on top of it and it walks me down the hill. That's exactly what it is. Yep. That's yeah. exactly what it is. All right, so what do we got on the docket for this, the final episode under this College Info Geek podcast moniker? Well, I thought we'd uh, get a little nostalgic, talk about maybe what we learned through the episode. I had a bunch of questions back mm. when, I, when I was asking for the Q&A. A bunch of questions were particularly relating to what we had thought about this, this show. So uh, I liked several of those questions. I think okay. we just run through those. That actually gives a pretty good overview of maybe what we've learned and um, what we liked about the show, what we're looking forward to in the new one. It's a, it's a time for reflection before we move on to the next chapter, which again, starts only in like a couple weeks and is not that disconnected. So just say subscribe and you get the next chapter for free. That is true. We're trying to make it as seamless as possible. It's like, yeah, you don't need to go same, find us again. That would be a waste of your time. But make improvements, which is, I think, the way to do things. I have long held this belief that comes from observation that what people truly want is more of what they're used to with a little tiny injection of novelty. This is why shows like Stranger Things are so popular. It's, oh, it's the 80s. I already seen this before, but it's a little bit different. So it's it's a little bit comfortable, a little Mm -hmm. bit new. That's why everyone wants to go see the new Marvel movie. It's like, you know what? There's going to be a guy with some cool powers and there's going to be a villain and he's going to have kind of the same powers, but a little bit meaner looking and they're going (laughs) to. I love the videos where I can't. I don't know the dude's name because I don't watch enough YouTube, but where he's like, how are we going to make a villain? How about we have the guy with the same powers, but like (laughs) the evil version? I really I love that clip and that is uh, i love that ZD. yeah i i love that i love that guy's videos <laughs> people, i just I lo- the couple that i've randomly like seen <laughs> what, what can we do i don't know how about like charm with <laughs> so, an actually interesting it's so good backstory how about he's dr strange but the evil dr strange i love he it wants to open the dark so much. dimension <laughs> <laughs> jamie pull that up it, it really is like <laughs> it is really like a six-year-old wrote the concepts for so many villains it really is but yeah i think that there's there's some truth to it like why is the most (laughs) profitable highest grossing movie of all time just like hey they're fighting another big bad but this time there's more heroes and there's yeah it's it's comforting but still exciting, which is yeah. a lot of what we want. We want a story mm-hmm. and that what we bring to you relate to. In fact, like there, there is so much to unpack there. You know, you look at any kind of show with like wacky characters that's successful. It's usually because there's an audience stand in character that people can say who's like flabbergasted around. the whole time, like Jim from the office. Yeah, Jim everybody is like else the is one who's absurd and he's normal. just like, yeah, this is weird. He looks at the camera. He's like, yeah, I, yeah, this is weird to me, too. We're, we're on the same mind here. And mm. meanwhile, Michael's like, I burned my foot on a George Foreman oven. I need to put it in an MRI machine. Yeah. And it, I mean, somebody relates to that, but <laughs> probably not <laughs> the majority of the audience. Somebody. Yeah. Uh, so our aim is uh, 
basically kind of do what we've been doing because I think we, you know, we have a good show going here. I enjoy chatting with you. Um, but you know, ditch the college name because we don't talk about college and then use the opportunity that we have changing over to a new show to maybe make a few improvements to the flow and things like that. Yeah. Well, actually the first question I got on this list here is what are you most looking forward to? with the new show. And I think that that's, that's a lot of it. I'm looking forward to the new range we might be able to talk about. Yes. I've, I've often wanted to bring in topics that I just, and, and like books that I thought were really interesting, but I couldn't figure out how to angle them right mm-hmm. to like make them ostensibly halfway fit into a, a college vibe. But also yeah. there's a lot of, um, I feel like there are a lot of people that maybe have sort of tuned out over the years because they graduated. Yep. And I've heard from people, even friends that are like, oh, you're talking about stuff that's not college because like college is in the name. So I just don't listen. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. Also, personally, I don't care if any of the people I know listen to this podcast, but that's why I'm excited for people to realize, hey, we're not actually really talking about college anymore. Like you said, we're years and years out of it. I don't have any exam tips for you. I don't take them anymore. Mm-hmm. And I've I, seen we've people... talked about that already. We, we did it. Yeah. I've seen people, even people who have DM me being like, oh, you have a podcast or, you know, I knew you had a podcast, but I never gave it a shot because it had that college name. So I yeah. figured it was just for students. We're graduating now. Yes. Finally, after, you know, so, well, the funny thing is I started my podcast right before <laughs> I graduated from college. Yeah, yeah we've been January, like out the whole time, but we're so January far away 20- from it now. Yeah, it was January 2013. And I graduated May 2013. So I think I had only done like four episodes before I graduated. So, you know, which yeah. I think I think we did a lot of really good student focused stuff. I look back to, to series like the Path to College that we did, you know, and that yeah. like that, that will be archived and will be always available. But um, yeah, the thing I'm looking forward to the most is getting to talk about a topic and not having this little worry in the back of my mind, like how do I make this relatable to students? Yeah. Because in, in always trying to force that you make it non relatable to people who have maybe moved on in some yeah. cases. And I have to skip over like some deeper philosophical thoughts. Cause I'm like, that's mm-hmm. a little weird for, for like a college vibe. Yeah. Let's get um, existential kids. <laughs> exactly and I, I think with a name like the Inforium, we don't even have to necessarily limit ourselves to always talking about self-improvement in some way or the other it mm. could just be like we're going to talk about you know I some would, philosophical concept this week i would love to oh yeah also one thing i'm looking forward to is that i can talk i, I can look at books and be like let's talk about this without even trying to make it a productivity book because i've read so many now that at this point I would be willing to read one if I thought it would help people to hear what we have to say about it. But man, do I not want to read a productivity book for myself? Like in the yeah. next, just, I need like another <laughs> six books in a row that are not that. In the next ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably end up reading more productivity books in the future. But um, if, if there, I were particularly so compelled, but I feel like too many in a row and it's just like, ah, mm, I didn't even need new inspiration. There was when it comes down to it, I know everything I need to know about productivity personally, maybe with the exception of certain technical information about, you know, how, how could we improve the workflow of our specific business? But when it comes to the overall philosophy of productivity, I know, you know, you got to eliminate distractions. You have to learn how to focus. You have to do these things. And most importantly, you got to want to do what you're doing. You got to find a reason for your brain to care. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Um, you know, the, just for example, uh, I'm starting the process of looking to buy a house and knowing like, oh, I have all these new challenges. I have to figure out all this stuff. I have to find a realtor. I have to, you know, get the down payment information. I have to figure out where to go. It's like a fire has been lit under my butt again. And it's like instant. Oh, move faster, work harder because you got something. You got this big mission now. Yeah. You need that intrinsic motivation. And now Mm -hmm. you have something. 
that's actually something that I, I think uh, I ended up learning from this podcast too. I think the best episodes that we've done were the, the episodes where we were both personally most excited about or invested in what we were. The conversation's better because we're mm-hmm. like in. Do you, do you have like off the top of your head a favorite episode or a few favorite episodes? I have two that I can think of that I really liked. Okay. I got to um, bring up the, the show. I'm going to bring it up on Spotify one, so I can see all the titles. I really liked the video game productivity one that I did that yeah. I, I did because I sat down and did so much research and I like went through all my favorite games. I turned on some new games. I just went through it and I was like, what am I doing right now? That's fun. How is this rewarding to me? And that was really fun to research and critically think about yeah. how games are designed to reward us. Uh, I, I also really liked the 10 things we tell our 18 year old selves episode. That was a good one. That was a good one. Um, I remember really liking the, I think it was 10 skills every student should have, which ended up mm. being one of our most popular episodes. That has an octopus on the front. It has an octopus. It's one of my favorite thumbnails that Ashley's done. It's a very skilled actually. octopus. I love that one. Um, the ones I think back to, and this should probably tell me something about the kind of content I should be making. I really enjoyed the budgeting episode, the investing episode, the episodes we did on buying a house, all those personal finance ones, which I mean, who would have thought that I would enjoy those things when I also ran a personal finance podcast for three years. (laughs) Uh, and then my, I don't even have to think my favorite episode I ever did on Alyssa Money Matters was the cryptocurrency episode. Not because I currently have any particular huge interest in cryptocurrency, but at the time when all the Bitcoin stuff was going on, I'm like, I'm interested in learning how the blockchain stuff works. And it was like a rabbit hole. And I just devoured as much as I could. And when, when you're in that state of mind where you just got to devour all the information about something, that's when it's fun. Yeah. When you really, I, when you're learning because you like hunger for the knowledge, it's mm-hmm. learning is really fun when it's not forced on you, which is, you know, one of the many problems with traditional school systems sometimes is that they don't give students reasons to care. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I would say I also really liked the hedonic treadmill episode, mm. but also and I think I once talked about man's search for meaning just briefly in one episode. I don't remember what it was, but I, I like thinking about that. I really like stuff that makes me think philosophically about why one would live for what, what would I live for? Yeah. Purpose, uh, meaning good. I like the big philosophy things that make me question how I'm living. Yeah. Yeah. This week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at Skillshare, who have been a longtime supporter of this show. Skillshare is an online learning library with thousands of classes that you can use to improve your skills, your creativity, and even your career prospects. They've got classes in tons of different topics, ranging from graphic design to video editing to digital animation and programs like After Effects to music production, business analytics, marketing, all kinds of really cool stuff, including two classes from yours truly on productivity. I've got a class on how to build your productivity system, which if you are a student going back to school or maybe you're just trying to get a little bit more organized in your job, you may find that useful for getting more organized in terms of how you uh, manage your to-do list items, your calendar items, your notes, all that good stuff. And I also have a class on building stronger habits that you actually stick to. So if you want to take your goals, break your goals down into actionable daily habits and learn how to actually keep doing them every single day, even after the novelty wears off when you get started, those will be very helpful for you. Uh, Those classes exist alongside, again, thousands of other classes. And I do want to highlight one class in particular this week, which I've actually been taking. It is called Adobe Illustrator CC Essentials Training by Daniel Scott. And actually, Daniel Scott has quite a few classes on Skillshare, all having to do with uh, training you how to use the Adobe products. So if you're somebody who wants to learn graphic design or illustration, then this Illustrator course is a great place to start. Personally, I'm somebody who is pretty well fluent in Premiere, which is their video editing program, in After Effects, which is their animation program. I know Audition pretty well because we've been editing this podcast in Audition for years. And I I know Photoshop pretty well, but I don't really have a whole lot of a good grasp on Illustrator. Uh, But I'm learning actually a lot 
going through this class. And I want to use what I'm learning uh, personally to possibly be able to do some cooler animations in my videos going forward. I know that if I can illustrate things in Illustrator, I'll actually be able to port them over to After Effects and do cool motion graphics that way. And then I've actually got in my head a couple of ideas for album art concepts for songs that I'm working on. And I think I'm going to need Illustrator to actually realize those unless I want to hire somebody else to do it. But you know what? I got that DIY mindset and I want to learn how to do it. So I'm learning how to do it on Skillshare. Uh, and the cool thing about Skillshare is number one, it's an incredibly affordable platform. A lot of online course platforms charge a lot of money, but Skillshare doesn't. Their plans start at less than 10 bucks a month. And if you go over to Skillshare.com slash geek and sign up, you can actually get a two month unlimited free trial, which means that from the date you sign up, you're going to have two full months with completely unlimited access to watch as many courses as you please. And if you are an ambitious person who is willing to dedicate the time, you could probably go through both of my classes, this entire Illustrator class, Daniel Scott's Photoshop class, all kinds of stuff during that trial. It's all up to you. And once again, it's super affordable after you get through that trial. So there's not a huge incentive to rush, but if you wanted to, you absolutely could. The other cool thing about Skillshare is that their classes have a hands-on component. Every single class comes with some kind of project so you can immediately start applying the skills that you're learning. A lot of the classes even have example files that you can download. Uh, Daniel Scott's Illustrator class is no exception. There are example files that you can download so you can kind of compare what you're building in Illustrator to what he was actually doing on the screen, or you can take what he built on the screen and tweak it and mess with it. Um, I think there was this jazz musician called Clark Terry. He had this whole philosophy of getting good at jazz music, which was called imitate, assimilate, innovate. You first imitate the works of the masters. You assimilate the fundamental building blocks of what they were doing with those compositions and pieces. And then you use what you learned to innovate, to create your own things. And that's a great use of those example files. So once again, if you want to get started with Skillshare, you want to start improving your skills in pretty much any area, then go over to Skillshare.com slash geek and sign up for that two month free trial. It'll also help support the show. So thank you if you do that. And big thanks as always to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. And a second thanks goes out to our other sponsor this week, which is brilliant. If you are somebody who's interested in getting better at math, getting better at science, or getting better at computer science and programming. Brilliant is something you absolutely are going to want to check out. It is an online learning library with tons. I think it's over 60 courses now that are laser focused on not only helping you improve your mastery in these three STEM focused areas, but also helping you become a better overall problem solver, analytical thinker, and creative thinker. And that is because all of their courses are built upon a bedrock foundation of active learning. And you know, if you've been listening to this podcast for a long time, or if you've been watching my YouTube videos or reading College Info Geek articles for a long time, we are advocates of active learning as much as you can possibly do it. Because when you passively learn, when you just kind of sit back and think that, you know, reading over something passively is going to help you learn by osmosis, you're going to pick up a little bit. But the more interested you are, and the more active you are, and the more you wrangle with the information and make mistakes and figure out how to fix your mistakes, the more efficiently you're going to learn, the more you're going to learn in less time. And Brilliant understands that, which is why from the get-go, you're going to be solving problems. But they're also bite-sized problems, and they're ordered very logically. So you're not going to find yourself too frustrated, but again, you are going to be making little mistakes and remaining active the entire time. When you get into Brilliant's library of courses, you're going to find a full math suite, which ranges from the basics of number theory and algebra and geometry and goes all the way up to things like vector calculus and math for quantitative training and finance and probability courses. So tons of cool stuff within the math area. There are science courses like electricity and magnetism, gravitational physics, all kinds of really cool stuff like that. And they have computer science courses. If you want to learn programming, there is an intro Python programming course. But I think even more importantly, there is a whole suite of courses that will help help you build a fundamental understanding of the underpinnings of computer science. There are courses on algorithm design. There are courses on computer memory. And if you're somebody who wants to get into software development, programming, those kinds of things, it is incredibly important to have an understanding of how algorithms work conceptually, 
you know, the building blocks of them. It's very important to understand how computer memory works, because if you understand how memory works, you understand how to build more efficient applications that are better built to utilize the available resources and to do things faster and more cleanly. And that will make you a better, more competitive programmer. So again, whether you want to get better at math, science, or computer science, you're going to want to give Brilliant a try. And you can do so by going over to brilliant.org slash college info geek. Once again, that is brilliant.org slash college info geek. And to sweeten the deal a little bit, if you were one of the first 200 people to use that URL to sign up, you're going to get 20% off your annual premium subscription, which gets you access to all of those premium courses. So as always, thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. And let's get back into it. I also remember liking the series we did on influence. Oh, that was a big one. That was there six like, episodes. Were there, I think, yeah, it's a lot of episodes. On one book, which I'm I'm not opposed to doing. But it was cool because we actually get a. I feel like some of the book review episodes. I don't think they were bad episodes, but I feel like sometimes the book could have been split, and we're mm-hmm. forced to like cram all these big points into, you know, like three bullet points and hope that. That's enough. I really liked splitting that out yeah, so that we could really dive into the lessons. Yeah. I mean, like, is it even a smart idea to try to do a one hour podcast about an entire book? I think it just is born from like a a one to one thing. One book, one episode, you know, it's it's clean. It's simple. But a book has so many ideas in it. And I think the doing that series, it was a great way to really dig into the core ideas of that book. And, and get time to actually talk about them in depth. Yeah. So perhaps when we do book episodes in the future, it should be episodes for a book, not just one. And that would also neatly solve one problem that somebody brought up. I think this may have been in the comments on YouTube for the last episode. Uh, they had said that they liked the book episodes, but they would love if we had some way of telling people, hey, we're going to do this book, just letting you know so you can read it ahead of time yeah for like a book club kind of feel Mm -hmm. now i guess like there there is also something the listener can do which is don't choose to listen to that episode until you've read the book but i know a lot of people they get on a a routine they want to listen whenever it comes out every other monday or whatever it is and uh, if there's an opportunity for us to be like hey we're going to be doing this book in the future uh you know read it ahead of time if you want that could be useful And if we're going to do multiple episodes for a book, that also makes it easier for the reader. Because let's say like one book I definitely want to do is range. Instead of being like, hey, you got to read the entirety of range before the next episode comes out. We could be like, hey, we're going to talk about the first part of the book. Oh, yeah. That that would kind of tie that up, especially because if people are busy, I mean, I barely have time to read Mm -hmm. and I want to read all the time. So I could definitely see somebody not being able to read a book in two weeks because we were just like, Hey, by the way, we need you to read thinking fast and slow in four days. (laughs) Go. It's not possible. It just do not, (laughs) do not ever stop reading. And by the way, you're going to want an audio book part of it at 200 times speed. And then maybe you'll, you'll be good then. Oh my gosh. Like we, you can't get ready for that. So Cutting it into pieces, maybe we look through the contents and like, oh, that looks like a logical section we could talk about. Let's read that. That would make a lot of sense. As somebody who creates content for a living, that book, I got like 100 pages into into it and then, you know, I burned out because every other sentence, I'm like, oh, I got to flag that. I can make a video about that. Oh, imagine trying to make a one hour episode on the whole book. Oh my gosh. I, I imagine somebody just reading the book out of interest who didn't intend to do anything with the information in a professional context they could get through it um even still it is a very dense book it is study result after study result it is an onslaught it's not an easy read but hey i I imagine that reading amos and tversky's actual scientific papers would be even more dense and i'm sure we have a lot of listeners in the audience who uh have to do that which that reminds me we've gotten a few questions from from listeners who were undergrad listening to our show and have now gone on to postgrad and they're they're wondering if we can like give tips about you know postgrad productivity in life the one problem here is that 
neither of us did post grad. Yeah, I've considered it, CIG but did. I've definitely considered it. But yeah, it's like a lot of time that I'm not spending doing those things. I could just as yeah. easily buy some textbooks that were being assigned and mm-hmm. flip through them myself. I would need a very strong goal that I was very committed to. And it would have to be something that would that would require a lot of sacrifice in what I'm doing already for me to even consider postgrad. Yeah. And I don't even know if postgrad would be the right choice for anything I could think of because I've learned so much about learning and I think it would have to be something where I'm like, all right, for whatever reason, I really want to go work for this company and this position absolutely requires a master's degree in something. You know? Yeah. Otherwise, I am confident in my ability to learn trial by fire. Just do it. So, um, but what I can say is College Info Geek, the site, that's still going. And while my personal professional endeavors have largely moved away from personally producing content for CIG, it is uh, it is essentially like a property in a media company that I actively run. Yeah. And so what what will probably end up happening is as time goes on, my face will probably no longer be the dominant branding on College Info Geek at some point in the future. And we will largely, we will probably be looking for a more diverse staff of writers or at least some sort of process for bringing in people with true professional experience. Um, I think Ransom has done a few experiment articles where he's gone and either interviewed people like a journalist or he's uh, had people come in and write articles uh, with their own experience, kind of fleshing out the content base with yeah. more real experience, and, you know, rather than just I did internet research and read more blogs and came up with something. So, for example, we had uh, Shirag Shemesian, who runs Shemesian Consulting, which helps people get into med school, law school, grad school. He's written a couple of articles about uh, about law school, about getting into grad school, which you know, those are just going to be better than anything I could write because I don't have that experience. Yeah, there are some topics you can't just like think about really hard and then be like, maybe if I just imagine, I'll know what it's like to try to learn to be a doctor. I mean, yeah. I'm thinking hard. <laughs> thinking that's, real what hard. I got, that's what I got so far. I don't need like experience. We, I just, we, just, we, can't, we can't live every life in order to have the experience to write about them. Right. So for those of you in grad school, you probably aren't going to get a whole lot of specific grad school focused guidance from me or from Martin. Um, but we are working to flesh out the content offerings we have on College Info Geek for you by finding people who actually have that experience. Yeah. Who can also write well. And then, uh, you know, I just, I have to double down on what I'm good at and what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about YouTube. I'm passionate about building businesses. I'm passionate about building productivity systems. And, you know, I have a deep working knowledge about making videos and the technical bits in that like that kind of stuff I'm really interested in love and I like personal finance so stuff like that is probably where you're going to see more from me personally in the future along with uh, the general self-development content that I've been doing because that's where I'm knowledgeable but yeah uh, so I guess we kind of covered a lot of what we're looking forward to in the new show I'm mainly looking forward to flexibility yeah. Um, also looking forward to using the changeover as a way to maybe introduce some segments, some ways to sort of either break things up or I don't know, yeah. make it more interesting. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to think about how we might do that. And I think I just think there are some interesting things we could touch on. We already basically had some forms of repetitive types of content like book review episodes or five questions. Just what can we do on a smaller scale and yeah. what other things could we do that are interesting? Mm-hmm. Like one idea what I had was uh, sort of project updates because we're always trying to work on cool stuff on the side. It might be interesting yeah, to occasionally be like, hey, this is how this thing is going and some challenges I've been running into as a way both to talk about the project and to 
hold both of us accountable to actually having something to say about a project. Right. Because if our update is, well, I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing. And therefore, I have no updates. Live your best life, Martin. Yeah. Update me. What kind of buildings have you been building? You finished the museum yet? Oh, that's a duh. I've done that a million years ago. <laughs> Except for now, there's new things to find for the museum because you can go underwater. I haven't been playing all that much Animal Crossing lately. I'm I'm not fair. living my best life. That's fair. But yeah, another thing I'm uh, interested in, that was really weird. My monitor just went all sepia. I think I think the um, sun must have gone beyond a cloud, and then my. If Mac you was could like, try ah. not to like accidentally vibrate your molecules into the old timey universe, that'd be cool. What if I want to though? It's kind of like Bioshock Infinite. Well, like we're recording though. That's it's true. Ru- it's rude to leave the recording to a different universe. It's going to you sound gotta, like one of those old timey announcers. Um, one thing that I think might be interesting is is taking what we had done as full episodes and sort of building those into more frequent recurring segments. And what I think that might do is make every episode more of like a, not a grab bag, but like make it more enticing to listen to every episode, even if the title topic Mm. isn't something that a person is particularly interested in, because that's maybe not the only thing we're going to talk about. Well, the five questions were always really popular for that very reason. So that's. And a lot of the podcasts I've listened to in the past, it's like, Okay, maybe I'm not interested in the title topic, but they're probably going to do reader Q and A as well, or they're probably going to do um, an, an update on projects they're doing. Like, I want to hear about that too. Yeah. So it might just be a smarter way to design the show, or not, and it'll all blow up. We'll see. We'll find out. Mm-hmm. All right. Do you want to just go through the rest of these questions? Yeah. The, this yeah, this second question is hilarious to me. Who do you think is the better podcaster out of the two of you? Yeah, I thought that was an interesting question, but honestly, I don't know how to answer it. What does that mean? I mean, you've done more podcasts on more shows, so probably you, but it's a podcast. Isn't that question basically saying which it depends on the listener, which personality and viewpoint they like hearing better? Mm-hmm. So here's what it is. You know. make me a better podcaster. Aww. And I know that's the diplomatic answer, but it's also true because I, I the only reason I've kept doing this podcast is because you do it with me. If it was me monologuing like I used to, I would have quit a long time ago. <laughs> and if yeah. it was me doing guest interviews, I would have quit a long time ago. I love podcasting because I have time every couple of weeks to sit down with my best friend and I just have a chat. I, I would say we, that's one of my favorite things about podcasting, actually. Mm hmm. It's uh, even if we're busy, we're forced to have a reasonable conversation. Mm-hmm. And and I think you've got a point there without if it's a conversational podcast like this. We would both podcast slightly differently talking to someone else because we've got our own conversational kind of mix that happens. It's just the way we naturally talk to each other. I wouldn't talk the same if it was somebody else. So therefore, you might hear a completely different conversational version of me that you don't like if somebody else was on the show instead. Yeah. And yeah. with with guest ones, we used to have to edit it. And like it's difficult because you can't guarantee each guest is going to vibe with you the same mm-hmm. way. I did most of my guest episodes before you were a full-time partner on the show. So yeah. I also edited them myself. And it was always a grab bag with guests. Because some guests are super good on a podcast. They can carry the conversation themselves in many cases, and it's great. Some guests, you have to drive the conversation as a podcaster. And that that's one of the biggest things I've learned is if you're going to do a guest-driven show, hosting is a skill that yeah. has a lot of facets you don't consider when you're a listener because at least I had automatically assumed hosting a podcast is just having a conversation with another person. But the fact of the matter is when people know they're being recorded, they act differently. Sometimes they get a little bit more boisterous and a little bit more showman like, like I do. And some, some people just kind of clam up a bit and a good host knows how to drive the conversation to make people feel more at ease and to kind of get interesting conversation out of them. So that's asking the right questions. That is uh, digging in when somebody gets going on a roll. Um, 
it's making them feel at ease. There's a lot to it and it can be mentally exhausting and sometimes it can still be rough. Yeah. You have to work to bring out their best selves because if you're interviewing people, uh, I mean, it's not even that they're not interesting. They're all interesting. It's just that they may not be used to podcasts. If you yep. find somebody who's really good at one thing, but they're just not that great at being a podcast guest because they've never done it. You have to find a way to bridge that gap in order to get that information that they're holding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. And, and some guests go in the complete opposite direction. I think this wasn't a podcast, but one of the most difficult guests that I had to host uh, was Neil deGrasse Tyson. And the funny part was it was posted on their channel. It was on Star Talk, but uh, it was me. I did a video and then Sam from Wendover did a video and MKBHD did a video. But in each case, it was like the YouTuber was kind of the one hosting and asking Neil questions. And then and then Neil would just be Neil. Um, but Neil is like Neil in real life is like he is in in videos and TV. He's boisterous and he likes to talk. <laughs> and I found like it wasn't it wasn't so much a case as drawing stuff out of him. It was like reining him in a little bit. You're like and, a you're <laughs> like a you're shepherding. Yes. What's that called where the dog does the thing where it runs around? The sh is it corralling? Is that what it is? So or is there? A, I mean, that's probably it. It's possible that I'm trying to search for a word, and I just have a feeling that it's, and I'm my feeling is wrong. But it, corralling, shepherding, herding, herding sheep, stuff like that. Like you got to kind of just say, no, no, we're boxing you into this. Come over here. <laughs> that is kind of what it felt like. Yeah. Talk about this one. So yeah. So, so sometimes I know that we're star stuff. I get. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. That's that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I know we're star. Come stuff. on. Come on. So yeah. Um, long story short, I, I enjoy the fact that I've interviewed so many guests and I think I did even more on listen, money matters, but I much more enjoy just talking to a friend and as a listener of podcasts, um, which I only listen to one podcast these days, which is money lab, my friend Matt's podcast, when it is him and Andrew, who are two of my best friends in the world. I do not care what the topic is. I will download it and I will listen to the entire thing probably multiple times. If it is Matt interviewing a guest, I'm always like, oh, it's a guest episode. So now I'm like <laughs> purely picking on topic because for me, podcasting is absolutely a parasocial thing where a lot of the it's enjoyment I get out of it is the feeling like I'm just hanging out with a couple of buds. And then also, you know, listening to something interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah, that really is the the vibe. It's just like you're, I'm going to be the quiet friend today. Let me listen to these other two friends have a good conversation and I'll pretend I'm there. It's like, it's very similar vibe. Mm -hmm. So it feel, when they feel comfortable, the listener will feel more comfortable. Yeah. And on a show like ours... There, there is no better podcaster because the, the greatest thing that comes out of it is the dynamic. Yeah, we, we agree on a lot of stuff, but we disagree on a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. primarily along obvious lines like minimalism versus complication and, and things. But that makes it so that we're going to have something to say yeah. rather than just, yes, that is a good point. Why, yes, I thought it was. <laughs> good one. What, what? Brilliant. Uh, and, and there's different personalities. And different listeners are going to identify better with one or the other. I remember there was one review on iTunes that was like, Martin is great, but that Tom guy is such a jerk and all he does is talk about himself. And <laughs> <laughs> that's maybe I, do, wow. I don't know, but, uh, you got him. Just, you got him. Good reviewer. That Tom guy. He is such a jerk. It's just look at him. A jerk. Look at that guy with his jerk face over there. Jerk face. Uh, but you know, it just goes to show you that different personalities are going to appeal to different people. Yeah, even when we agree, we might agree and explain why we agree in such a way that like your way makes sense to somebody, but my way is like, I don't know why I agree with the end result, but the path that they took to, to make that opinion, that's not my path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think we're, was it, was I talking to you about debt and how like you kind of agree with the more emotional argument of kill 
um oh i like loans um, first. i like snowballing yeah, because it snowball feel method. because to me feeling the debt demotivates me which prevents me from doing my best work which prevents me from potentially pushing through and earning more and getting out of debt faster even though mathematically that's the wrong direction yep. but whereas i'm like beep boop i will use the stack method to optimize yeah. the payoff as good as i possibly can and then i will build a spreadsheet with yeah. a graph so i can see my balance overall lowering but you know i both both points are valid and when you get into an interesting discussion about why this valid point means more to you than the other one it, that's where you know interesting dialogue comes out even if yeah. you do kind of agree a lot a lot of things uh okay so what, the next question was, what is one thing you like and one thing you dislike about podcasting? I, mean, I think we kind of covered the things we like. Yeah. Pretty well. So what's something you dislike about podcasting? Well, I wouldn't change it, but I don't always like being on um, video. Mm. And not only just because like, I'm like, oh man, I need to make sure that my hair doesn't look dumb today. Look, it's sticking up and I need to, I need to fix that stuff like that because I'm yeah. like, it. it's semi-permanent. So it's, even if I wouldn't care in normal life, I'm like, but that's going to just, you can't change that. It's just going to be up that way. Right. But also because um, there are times, and I see comments like this sometimes. So y'all got a little bit of a point. Sometimes they're like, Martin looks like sad today. What's going on there? And I'm like, I don't know how to hide that always. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like I lost my stepdad last year. It's probably true. I'm sure they were right that there were a few episodes where I'm just like not looking like I'm I'm feeling great. Yeah. And that's it's like hard for me. I don't try very hard to lie about how I'm feeling. Right. About about like physically, which is why I'm almost never visibly excited except for like Pokemon. And, you know, I mean it because it's the <laughs> one of the few times where I'm like, What? But um, that part is difficult for me because yeah. I know that people are going to be able to pick stuff like that out. And it makes me second guess myself a little bit sometimes. And it's weird. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a thing inherent in making content for a large audience that you don't have a direct two way line of dialogue with. Because if you're yeah. sad, right, and you go to work and you know, you're trying to remain professional, trying to keep that stuff separate, but sometimes it leaks through anyway. You can talk to people like if it's your coworkers. But you can like explain. Yeah, like, that's not just, that bad. I'm just thinking about this thing. Having a rough day. Right. But if if it's, you know, if it's your job to make a podcast episode or if it's my job to make a video and there is something going on in the personal life that's, you know, not cool. You can't really talk one-on-one -on -one with your audience it's just you if you yeah. look a certain way they're gonna pick up on it and then they're gonna be like well what's going on and you know and like what am i supposed to do like uh if, if i were to explain it to the audience i'm just gonna make an incredibly depressing episode that day which yeah i'm sure not everybody's like let me download that i'm i'm ready to feel sad mm -hmm. uh, and also i'm just not that i kind of have a resting neutral face i would say i i very <laughs> often just look disinterested but really it's just because i'm chill you are quite chill yeah it's very hard to make me look excited elder scrolls pokemon a few things will do it but most of the time i'll just be like whoa that's that's really cool yeah but see that's something i really like about you because then when there is something that actually excites you or if i say something that actually makes you laugh it's like i know that it was actually it like seems out of character yeah, almost you but know. you know it's it's real yep I'm I'm not acting for anybody else. That's that's I think part of the the good thing that comes from that. It's just weird when people see me at like the the more sad parts, and I got to figure out how do I pretend I'm not sad today. Mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah, it's tough. And boy, that's that's a whole thing we could unpack if we wanted to. Because on the surface, I want to say what my mom always said is, "Don't bring your problems to work." And she told me that when I started at the grocery store, if you're having a bad day, don't bring it to work. You go and you, you be professional and you do your work and you smile at the customers and then you go home and that's when you can deal with your crap. Um, but there's also an argument to be made for uh, when, when you are building these weird parasocial relationships online, being honest about your problems can actually be helpful. 
because yeah. it lets the audience know, especially those of those of uh, you, people in the audience who are dealing with things themselves that, hey, you're not alone. And this person that you listen to that you may think certain things about, they're a human just like you. Yeah. You no. Know? That said, I'm not going to go on every single video when I have some personal issue and be like, all right, guys, before we get into this today, I know we're, I said we're going to talk about this productivity technique, but uh, my cat's in the vet and I feel sad and I need y'all to know about yeah. that. Guys, I have a lot of back hair coming in these days <laughs> and I just uh, hate it. I just, I'm so sad about it. <laughs> what do I do? I've got a lot of back hair coming in. Anyway, here are five tips <laughs> that are going to help you focus more today. On things that are not my back hair problems. Before we get into what you clicked on, let me talk about my personal life a little <laughs> That's bit. That's like the beginning of every recipe blog where it's like, oh my gosh. I'm going to explain this fantastic French bread that you'll you'll have to see it to believe it. But first, I would love to tell you about the, the history of the land that I currently live on. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot to it. I and I, I can't blame those people. There are good SEO reasons why they, they might need Sanders to do that. Peak, but Tennessee. My father was a three fingered man with a bit of a temper and a drinking problem, but he had a heart of gold. And yeah. he went, one day on the farm, I went into the bar and I saw our old pig, also named Sanders, and he had crawled <laughs> this weird thing into the mud. And 20 years later, that's what inspired me to make these crab cakes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, allow me to Thank tell you, you a Sanders. twenty minute additional story. And then uh and then the, the recipe will be at the end with about eight hundred pop up ads covering it. <laughs> I hate what internet marketing has forced people to do. SEO and subscribe everything's like a mess. But that's a whole other topic. We should, but man, we should I can't it. even blame them because they kinda have to do this to get their stuff. I know. I get it. I get it, recipe bloggers. Yeah, and like it is really funny to meme the recipe blogs, but think about it from the recipe bloggers' point of view, especially if they're like trying to make a living at this. Yeah. You're just like, I really want to know how to make Brussels sprouts crispy. What what you would like as the person is to put that into Google and then to have Google just tell it to you without ever clicking something. And all the hard work that the blogger did experimenting with how to make the Brussels sprouts crispy and taking the pictures and all that, like, you don't care. Just yeah. tell me how. Just tell me how. And, you know, they got to find a way. Yeah, to but they can't somehow. gain an audience that way. So yeah, it's, it's a gotta tough situation. you got to tell stories about your old pig Sanders on your dad's farm to get people invested. Otherwise, they're just going to come in. Thanks for the information, bruh. How yeah. about? I don't know. And maybe there's a better way to do it. But uh, I, I have never tried to run a recipe blog. If I did, maybe I would find myself becoming that which I hate. Maybe. I also, I also wonder, like, how many of those stories are made up? Like, are there recipe bloggers who just oh, yeah. make up a character for themselves? You know, there's <laughs> got to be. There's like no way there aren't a few. That would be an interesting idea for a recipe blog. Make up a character, like a very eccentric character that comes up with all these recipes. It's not just you. Sounds like a fun writing project. It would be. Yeah, it's like. All right. Well, what's what's like. something what's something you dislike? Um, boy, good question. Um, I dislike uh, interviewing guests. Oh yeah. I yeah. think I'm just done with it. Just I, because it's it's like work. It's extra work. I used to do it a lot. Um, there's not a whole lot that I dislike about podcasting now. I guess I dislike that I get paid less for sponsorships on the podcast than we do on YouTube videos. But, but like we mentioned last episode, the dollar per amount of effort ratio is probably higher. <laughs> well, podcast. You, you don't overthink podcasts as much as you do with the videos oh, for, for reasonable so. reasons, but yeah. it seems like you're able to, with the podcast, just kind of be more natural and just say, well, there, there we did it. And then it's like, mm -hmm. same with the way less uh, stressful of a process. Same with the IGTV videos I'm doing now, which for people who don't know, I'm doing at least one moving up to two like Q&A style videos on Instagram every week. Where I'm just taking questions and I'm kind of like doing what we do on the podcast, a little more ad libby. And I don't have any expectations for what those videos are going to do. And they're not sponsored. They have basically zero impact on my income. I could probably not touch Instagram and still make the same amount of money. And because of that, it, it makes it easier to just 
feel loose. Just talk, whatever. If I flow a little bit, I'll leave it in. Yeah. I don't care. Pressure's That's nice. lower. I don't overthink it. Whereas with my YouTube channel, being the primary driver of this entire business's income and what keeps several people with keeping food on their table, I'm just like, oh, man, every single second of this video has to be perfect, which is just yeah, not great for creativity. So, but... I guess that's a thing I dislike about videos. Yeah. In terms of podcasting, when I was doing listen, money matters and I'd wake up on a Wednesday and Andrew would be like, all right, today we're interviewing these three people. So you're going to spend three hours talking to people you don't know hardly anything about. That's I dislike that. And I think that's because I'm, I'm an introvert. It sounds a little stressful to me to do that. Yeah. It was stressful when there were episodes where Andrew and I were just talking and he's like, Hey, I need you to go research uh traditional versus roth iras we're gonna do an episode about that oh sweet i could do that absolutely but it's like hey we're interviewing the ceo of this company that like helps make your fees lower I'm like okay all right you know and nothing against the person who runs the fee company it's just that's not me that's not what i like to do yeah i would rather either go be by myself and do a bunch of research or spend time talking to people I really like who I already know like good friends. Uh, all right. What's something you've learned about podcasting or from podcasting? Uh, I've learned that performative conversation is a skill. Mm. Mm -hmm. We have to talk on this and I have to change how I talk a little bit because I can't reference weird inside things that only you are going to get. I have to, Make sure that the conversation makes sense to an outside listener. I have to uh, sometimes I'll tr I'll try to like make sure I understand an idea and re-explain it in a way that maybe fits my personality more as a way of reaching the same idea out to the kind of person that identifies more with that. It's it's a different skill set to make the conversational good for or the conversation good for somebody listening. Mm -hmm. You know what, Martin? Why do we never why do we never let the audience like be in on the conversation? You know, like, like, we just, Dora we just let them in. Like, they, like, they, they, oh, what yeah, have you learned idea. from podcasting? That's cool. <laughs> wow. I never thought of that before. <laughs> I don't think that would work very well. <laughs> no, but it is really demeaning. <laughs> hey, and you, I like it in that way. Brenda, you know how you're riding the bus right now with like 800 other people? Oh, well, that's a big bus with like 30 <laughs> other people. <laughs> wow. I want you to talk out loud to your headphones about what you've learned about podcasting don't, don't ignore yeah. the looks ignore the looks ignore the haters you're talking to me right now i'm listening Block them out. that's all that matters <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder how many listeners are named brenda i should have picked a more common name i usually go with kevin but i want something different now well we'll come up if it's always something. kevin we'll, it's just the, the yeah. one guy kevin it's just like why are you always calling me out dude Ugh. yeah Anyway, um, I have learned that podcasting, like many other things, is a skill which transfers other over to other skills. And podcasting is the number one reason why I am a confident and I will say somewhat competent public speaker on stage. It was my, I won't say my first exposure to public speaking because I did a bit of that in high school. I took speech class. I was in some clubs where I had to do speeches. But... Um, it's where I got a lot of practice doing what you were talking about, performative either conversation or performative speech because I did used to do a lot of monologue episodes which are in mm, yeah. their own right a different kind of content and requires a different kind of skill. And doing that an hour a week, either talking into a microphone to an audience or talking to a guest or co-host for the benefit of an audience has as basically equated to practice talking on stage. It doesn't give you practice with the body motions, with uh, keeping eye, eye contact with the audience, with uh, that kind of stuff, but it gives you confidence with speaking confidently, with projecting, with uh, just the general feelings of nervousness that you get when you know you're talking to an audience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say actually become, I've become a much better small talker with people. I've become much better at, um, if somebody wanted that, I mean, I'm not getting a job interview these days, but I'm very confident in those situations. And I think that 
podcasting is a way to build up and push through a lot of that conversational anxiety. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You just, you have to be able to present yourself well. And I, and I'm much better at talking to strangers because of this. Yep. I'm just used to having to present my ideas. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, I also learned a lot of technical stuff. Podcast editing gave me a leg up for video editing. Mm-hmm. It also taught me about things like equalization or EQ, compression. Um, well, those are the two main ones that we use for podcasting. Uh, noise reduction plugins. And those have given me a leg up in the sound design that I do in my videos and also in music production. Because when you're talking into a microphone, sometimes it doesn't sound quite as good as you want it to. So you have to find out how to edit that audio. And that yeah. takes time and you learn how to use a DAW, Digital Audio Workstation. So yeah, in, term, in addition to the confidence and the speech skill improvements, um, there's a lot of technical things that we've learned. We've learned dealing with podcast RSS feeds, getting things onto iTunes and Spotify. And you know, there's a lot, I, a lot you learn in running a show. I used to be able to recognize a vocal pause when we were editing those out. Oh, I could yeah. recognize it in the waveforms. I'd be like, there's one, there's one, there's one. And it just, I could see them very niche skill. I don't know that that's ever going to pay off for me in any other way. You know what? But it you was interesting. That, but that's that's a thing. That's a job. Dialogue I, editing. Yeah, it was very, you know, you edit out a few thousand vocal pauses. You start to see that's what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Also having to merge words together from like a stuttered sentence and make it oh, sound yeah. like it was never. Uh, that stuff takes some work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with video editing... With videos, I'll flub lines sometimes over and over and over again. And I can see later on the waveforms will look similar, at least in the way they start. So I can be like, okay, that's the last take of that line. Cut that out. And then, oh, there's the last take of the previous line because I edit backwards. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite helpful. So, yeah, I guess you you learn to read the waveforms like the tea leaves. The waves. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Turtle was my father. You can call me Crush. So yeah, lots of things you learn from uh, running a show. Highly recommend trying it out. If it's something that you're interested in, you're going to learn a lot. I do remember yeah. uh, episode seven of the College Info Geek podcast was my interview with Pat Flynn from Smart Passive Income. How do you even do that? And you're starting to crackle again on your microphone. I'm not sure what's going on there. Really? Yeah. So you're fine now, but... I don't know if it was like a chord you hit or something. I'm not sure. I'll just not move a single molecule. <laughs> yeah, hope, hopefully it's fine. Um, so uh, Pat Flynn, he was at the time like one of those people I looked up to as like one of the gods of the Pantheon and having him in my podcast was, I thought, the coolest thing ever. And on that episode, he had told me that uh, he he has found that people who stick with their podcast for seven episodes are likely to keep it going after that. Most people who are going to quit end up quitting before episode seven. I don't know if that's like some kind of scientifically researched stat or if just it was an anecdote that he had seen, but I was pretty proud that I had gotten to episode seven hmm. and that he was my guest in episode seven. And you know what? We kept it going. Yeah. I haven't quit yet. 300 boy that's so long yeah it's, it has been long here's to another x number of years it's been seven years it's been seven years uh yeah let's see here what will you miss if anything about the cig podcast in particular i don't know being younger yeah i would say that for this since we're keeping a podcast going and it's going to be more or less similar but with better things for the CIG podcast in particular, most of what I'm going to miss is just thinking about college, being nostalgic, mm-hmm. being uh, not marching into my 30s where I'm forced to reconcile with the fact that I'm no longer a student. So, you know, I'm a student of life, my friend. Yeah, a student of so, life. I just would say that day. I would I would miss it more if we were quitting the podcast. Yeah, yeah. If we were quitting, there would be some things I'd miss. But but it's, we're just upgrading. 
I'm taking everything I love about this show and I'm retaining it and just jettisoning the parts that uh, no longer are relevant to me. Yeah. They, they are a part of my history. They are a chapter that will remain in that storybook of my life and career. And they will be forever accessible. Um, I guess one thing that I'll miss is having one website where I'm like, this is what I do. Uh, go there and you're going to find everything I do. Because now it's like, well, I have this college website called College Info Geek, and then the Inforium is going to be at its own website, and my YouTube content is actually quite different, so go check that out. There's not always an article for every video, and sometimes I do the articles for the videos on my personal website. Check that out, and there's the Instagram. It it's has like become a, a web. spread out now, and now I'm like, you know, doing stuff with Standard, stuff's on Nebula. Whoo! Yeah. All kinds of stuff. So... I guess I'll miss like that simplicity, but I think this is something that everyone is going to deal with in their career, especially people who build things that go on to either remain available or continue living. It's like if you're, de if you're delegating the work to other people, but it's still like a property you own. It's just like, that's a necessary consequence of, of progressing and getting further into your career. It's going to get a little more complex. Yeah. You know, unless unless I made like the the conscious choice to sell College Info Geek and be like, I just do my YouTube channel. That's it. But I don't want to. You know, so it's going to be a little more complex. That's fine. yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, and then we had one question. What are some of your favorite episodes or moments from the podcast? We've talked a little bit we, about we a few talked a little bit episodes. about a few, yeah a few of the favorite episodes earlier. One of my favorite moments. Well, it's not a particular moment, but um, I loved when you started editing the show, which is a big step for me. Yeah, because I had experience with you making the website, like coding the website, but that was that felt like a different kind of delegation because I did not know how to do responsive code. So hiring you to do that, it was delegation, but it didn't feel like I was giving you a job that I had already been doing. I literally didn't know how to do it. So it yeah, like, cool. Make me a responsive website with the editing. That was the first big thing where I was spending hours doing it, thinking I'm the only one who can do this. And then I gave it to you. And then eventually you learned how to do it better than I did. So that was cool. And I also loved how you would pull weird out of context snippets from the episodes. I did <laughs> do like that. Send me the audio files. I think my uh, favorite one is this is important. Um, uh, wave that I had a whole collection of those. Yep. Neil Pasricha, the guy who wrote, <laughs> uh, I think it was the happiness project. That is probably my favorite one. <laughs> it was my favorite one. It's just, there's a clip in the episode where he just says, I've written out a contract with my wife. Yeah, and the, and the way he <laughs> accentuates the the words, it sounds so good out of context. <laughs> so, it's so, and I stopped. File I stopped doing it eventually because it became like a lot of extra work, and and I was yeah. and we got busy. But I really like a lot of those, particularly from episodes with guests, because yes. like they'd talk about such different things that the chances that I'd find something that I could take out of context was was great. <laughs> Um, I, I have some, some interesting memories from the guest episodes for sure. Uh, so episode eight was with Gary Vaynerchuk. So that was pretty cool. And people often ask like, how did you get Gary Vaynerchuk on your podcast? Well, back when I started my podcast in 2013, I think Gary was coming out with, I'm, I'm sure, I want to say it was jab, 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 right hook. I think it was that book. Um, though it may have been the one before it. And one of his marketing tactics is he built this website where podcasters could request to have him on their show and he was going to do an interview a day for a full year. So I signed up and requested to have him on my show. And uh, I think I think Gary bit off more than he was willing to chew with that project because by around April, he had kind of abandoned it and was no longer doing an episode a day. I get it, dude. <laughs> Committing to a podcast episode a day 
on a different person's podcast every time, that is, I would never do it. Because it's going to be a lot of beginner podcasters who are going to ask a lot of the same questions, who don't have a lot of the same interview skill, doing that every single day for a year. <sighs> yeah. Um, so he never he never called me for the date that I had signed up for. And I was like, that's cool. You know, I, I didn't really expect much anyway. And then I think it was like three, four months later, I get a call. I'm walking on campus. I get a call. And this lady's like, hey, I work for Gary Vaynerchuk and he decided he wanted to be on your show. I'm like, what? Okay, okay. Um, so he was on the he was on the show. And I think it was my first taste of interacting with people who are just super busy because he is just in a cab on the phone. With me. <laughs> and I had to learn how to record phone calls. Uh, which now, like now I know how to do it a little bit easier. Um, but back then I was like, well, how, how does he, how he, how did he, how would he call my computer? I don't know. And I think what I had to do is buy Skype credit and then call him from Skype and then record from that. And it worked pretty well, but good thing you figured that out. Yeah. And then the other one that blew my mind was Arnie Duncan. Oh yeah. Was the secretary of education under Obama they reached out. I mean, it was his assistant, but they reached out and they were like, Arnie wants to be on your podcast. And I'm like, somebody in the president's cabinet wants to be on my podcast. What? So that is a, that is a pretty cool memory, uh, man. And yeah, I think that Obama and his cabinet, I think they, they did a lot to try to build closer relationships with students. Um, they did a lot with social media and I think that was just one of their attempts. They were like, let's experiment with getting on some student focused podcasts. Yeah. Uh, but still it's like to cool. me, it was like, I'm talking to one of the president's cap and that's so cool. So that was a cool episode. Um, it, it was like, it was a bit of a, a bit of a starched collar episode. I would say good conversation, but it wasn't one of those ones where I instantly hit it off with somebody, but it was still really cool. Definitely an interesting experience. But uh, yeah, nowadays, now that I've done all those, I very much like just talking with my friend Martin, hanging out. Yeah, it's pretty chill nowadays. Yep. Uh, I forget, what was the episode recently where we just died laughing at something and I, I couldn't stop laughing? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember either, but whatever that was, that was one of my favorite moments. <laughs> I do like when it... When it Occasionally, we just can't focus yeah, for a second because of something like that. Mm -hmm. I like breaking out of the, the, the fourth wall sort of thing where we're supposed to be all professional or whatever it is people do on the internet to look fancy. I like peeling back that curtain every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely like doing that. I would like to do more of that with the Inforium. Yeah. Or to do episodes about our process. You know, doing this for 300 episodes, doing videos, like 200 videos, doing this whole job for 10 years, I've grown to love the technical aspects of it. And I love talking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. So if, if people are interested, I would love to do some episodes where we talk about, you know, how we do the work that we do. Yeah. Um, cool. So is there anything else you want to cover? Before um, we start wrapping up, I don't even know how long I've been recording. A, that's all the main questions. Um, Hour that 12. I have. I guess uh, goodbye, College Info Geek Podcast. Goodbye, it's College been real. Info Geek Podcast. Yeah, it has been real. Real long time. Seven years, 300 episodes. Oh, and I forgot about the article narrations we used to throw into the feed as well. There are, I think, seven of those. Yep. There's seven Precisely. of those. Those were actually very good progress or practice for reading my audiobook. Oh, that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. reading and narrating a piece of text is different than just talking. You got to go slower than you think you do. At least I found. But yeah. 
So that's the College Info Geek podcast. But this feed is where you're going to find the Inforium starting, what is it, August 10th, I think? I think so. Do you know? Okay. I'm pretty sure that's what you said last time. I trust I trust that you looked at the dates correctly. Um, uh, I think I did, but I'm going to super double check just to double check. Because, uh, you know, I don't want to be wrong. Yep, August 10th. Yeah. Monday, August 10th is when you are going to be able to get the newest episode, the first episode of the Inforium. Yeah, the baton uh, between eras shall be passed on that date. Yeah, and we, we may have a special little thing in the feed before that. Oh, so yeah. So check that out. And yeah, thank you. Whether you've been listening to this show for seven years since the beginning or whether you've just picked it up in the last couple of weeks. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for being a listener. Thanks for the questions and the support and all of it. It's been awesome and it's going to continue to be awesome. Yeah. Podcasting's pretty dope. Feels like I have to walk a weird tight rope between signing off, but also not signing off because we're not really ending anything. Just a name. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to be misleading. But I did yeah. get a comment the other day where somebody was like, yeah, I've listened to every episode now. And I'm just like, that's that's so much. That's a that's, lot of content. It's impressive. That's like 300 hours. That's probably more than 300 hours because we usually go over an hour. by. Yeah, bit. yeah. That's a lot of time. It's impressive. Hopefully it was worth it and hopefully it continues to be worth it. Uh, all right. So the show notes for this episode if there are any, are going to be at cigpodcast.com slash 300. This is Sparta. Uh, and cigpodcast.com is going to be the place you can go to find all the show notes for all College Info Geek podcast episodes. Everything after that is going to be at theinforium.com. Yeah. Pretty easy. Just the theinforium, I-N-F-O-R-I-U-M. Dot com and uh, martin still has to build that as of oh yeah recording. i got that i got that on the docket but it'll be up and it'll be ready and it'll be cool and you'll be able to get all the show notes and cool stuff for the show going forward at that website but if you're already subscribed in spotify or apple podcasts or google podcasts or overcasts or pocket casts or youtube or whatever then just keep on doing what you're doing. Um, we are making some new podcast art. It's going to look quite similar to the current podcast art on purpose. Yeah. Because I don't want it to be like, what is that? You know, you should be like, okay, it's pretty similar. I know what this show is. Just for the people who didn't hear us say that the name is changing like five times. Uh, yeah. If you haven't subscribed already, then uh, for now, just go over to CIGpodcast.com. Um, we'll try to, can we have the Inforium up like just as a landing page by the 27th? Yeah. Okay. So if you want to, you can go to the Inforium.com. Either one will link you to the podcast feeds if you want to subscribe to the show, if you haven't done so already. And uh, beyond that, if you enjoy this show, Depending on when you're listening to it, it will either be the College Info Geek Podcast or the Inforium. You can look up either one of those names uh, in Apple Podcasts, and there's a way to review it and uh, give it a rating if you want to. So five-star reviews are always appreciated, and uh, they might help with the rankings in iTunes. I don't know how that works anymore. We got other cool stuff coming down the pipeline for you. It's going to be announced in Inforium episode number one. So definitely keep an eye out for that in your podcast feeds. And until then, we will see you in the next episode. Stay tuned.